Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live peer exchange titled Management of Follicular Lymphoma. Despite the fact that follicular lymphoma remains an incurable disease, outcomes are good for most patients with median overall survival exceeding 12 years. However, for the subgroup of patients who have high risk disease and develop early relapse or histological transformation, clinical outcomes after immunochemotherapy are still poor. In this Onc Live peer exchange, we will discuss evolving research surrounding the treatment of follicular lymphoma. We'll talk about how to incorporate newly available agents into your treatment approach, and we'll highlight the studies from the 2019 ASCO meeting. I'm Dr. Ian Flynn, Director of the Lymphoma Research Program at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Matthew Lunning, Associate Professor in the Division of Oncology and Hematology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Dr. John Pagel, Chief of Hematologic Malignancies and the Director of the Stem Cell Transplantation at Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, Washington. And Dr. Pierre Luigi Zanzani, Professor of Hematology and Head of the Lymphoma and CLL Programs at the University of Bologna in Bologna, Italy. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. So, um, so Matt, let's start with you. Um, you know, Flick lymphoma is an indolent lymphoma. It's different from some of the other indolent lymphomas. Tell us a little bit how you, uh, some of the different of the biology and perhaps a little bit about how you first evaluate patients with follicular lymphoma. Sure, so patients often come in with lymphadenopathy, or so enlargement of, of lymph nodes that are of a normal size. Sometimes these patients have had these lymph nodes for months, if sometimes years. Uh, a lot of times patients are having either excisional or, or core needle biopsies and when the pathologist looks under the microscope they see uh, a, an abnormal amount of follicles and with that they do special staining kind of looking at BCL2 expression within the follicles but they also may go and look in the genetic level. There you may find a translocation in chrom between chromosomes 14 and 18, which then leads to the overexpression of BCL2, which you shouldn't necessarily see in normal B cells. And so with that, in coordination of immunohistochemistry, what the morphologic features of the lymph node are, as well as incorporating uh, fish or cytogenetic testing, usually renders a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma. I think where it gets tough is on the pathologist is when they start to try to grade follicular lymphomas. In fact, I think it's very difficult to say uh, a grade one versus grade two, and often many people describe in the PATH reports grade one, two follicular lymphoma. You jump into even probably a more controversial and gray uh, area is follicular lymphoma grade three, uh, where it is sometimes parsed out as 3A versus 3B. Uh, characteristically in treatment, we've often treated uh, follicular lymphoma grade 3B akin to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, our most common uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and an aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But 3As I think are very controversial in the, in the treatment and sometimes you can get a biopsy that's follicular lymphoma grade 1, 2 and then you biopsy a different area and it could be follicular lymphoma grade 3A uh, uh, from that standpoint. So. Um, and then you kind of need to, uh, once you have the diagnosis, go further into staging. And uh, from a staging standpoint, um, typically I like to use PET, PET CT because I think it gives you the best idea of where the disease is at. Um, from that standpoint, very uncommonly will you see kind of localized follicular lymphoma. Um, more often than not, you'll see advanced stage. So, uh, lymph nodes that are above and below the diaphragm um, and can involve uh, uh, the bone marrow. Typically with staging, I, I may not do a bone marrow, uh, but it depends upon uh, whether or not I'm treating them now or potentially treating them uh, in the future. John, is, uh, is that your approach? Are you PET scanning everyone? Are you bone marrowing everyone these yeah. days? You know, I think it comes, uh, as we'll talk about lots through this presentation about different individual approaches for different individual patients. And I uh, would say that in general, you know, I don't think that doing a bone marrow will change what I'm going to do. And pretty much it's largely part of a research tool, I think, in this day and age. I think PET scan can help us also understand if there's marrow involvement in some cases or not. And I do do PET scans. I do think they've become the gold standard now in even in follicular lymphoma, especially at the end of treatment. I like them up front as well for the same reasons that Matt does and I assume that everyone else does is that it's really much more sensitive and it's much more specific and that kind of data is very valuable for assessing you know, how you're perhaps going to approach a patient. Uh, and the other thing of course that's very valuable about the PET scan is that it can tell you a little about uh, the activity of the lymphoma and really give you a clue or not if this is now even a more aggressive lymphoma based on the SUV values or the standard uptake values. 
you know, we all worry about uh, that patient who has an ab unusually high SUV value and that maybe there's some degree of transformation there. And that might lead me to want to biopsy something that's out of the order particularly hot. So I think there's a lot of value in PET scans. Um, you know, of course, we don't want to do too many of them. Uh, but I think uh, certainly for those reasons, as well as at the end of treatment, where it's really been shown to be particularly important for assessing response, that PET has now become our gold standard. You talked about transformation, you know, going from a follicular lymphoma to a more aggressive lymphoma, and the, using the PET scan perhaps to guide biopsies and, 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 uh, and figure that out. Do we, what do we know about, you know, why do some people transform and others do not? I thought you were going to tell me because um, <laughs> it's such a difficult thing. We, we really don't know, and that's the problem here is that in follicular lymphoma, we really don't have predictors uh, or markers to tell us who's going to do poorly, who's going to transform, and who's going to do extremely well. I mean, we have these patients who have been diagnosed with follicular lymphoma and never even gotten treatment for 20 years. Um, maybe it, there are some patients who never get treatment, actually, and what is different about them? And unfortunately, I... Uh, I, I don't think we have a very good handle on that yet, and that's a major disappointment, but really should be the major focus of research because that is probably the biggest unmet need in this whole area.